Welcome, Dr. Estrada. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm so happy that you're here with us today. So to get us started, I want to ask a question about an acronym that is used, that you use in your work, and it's P-E-E-R, PEER. Can you help unpack what that means? Yeah, this actually comes from the work um, from an article that was written by David Asai, who uh, is from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and it stands for People Excluded Because of Ethnicity or Race, or and Race, and it's really... Um, a term that I've adopted because it, it describes the situation <laughs> as opposed to minorities, which kind of says you're a small group um, of people, which is actually less and less true every year. And um, I do use historically underrepresented sometimes because I think there is a history of underrepresentation, but I don't want to affirm that it's going to continue to be that way. But the peers really talks about the exclusion that we're trying to stop from happening. And I like that it has that term in there and that's yep. going to stop. I like it too. And I'm trying to also move away from using the word minority and more the more active word minoritize, which has been helpful for me to kind of also see how complicit I am in that process of minoritization unless I'm critically making efforts not to be. So um, thank you for that. You have this story that I've heard you tell in a couple of presentations that you've done that really, it was really, it really stuck with me. Um, and it's a story about, um, it, it's a story that I think was kind of a turning point in for you with your own work. Yes. And it has to do with it, you know, really kind of how we're looking at the, the STEM problem. Can you share that story with us? Sure. Um, this happened, gosh, I think almost 12 years ago. It's hard to believe. But at the time, I was invited to, a, I think it was a AAAS meeting on why uh, certain ethnic groups were underrepresented in, in science and technology, engineering and mathematics and STEM fields. And so um, I was there and there was probably, you know, about a hundred people or they're all wonderful speakers. Um, Dr. Lent, who does work on, on efficacy and, um, Claude still was there who does work on stereotype threat. And so there was this whole discussion about why, why people like me who are Latina or African-American or Native American, why do we leave the, the sciences, um, and the research fields? So the story is, and it's a true story that I was there and on the second day, towards the afternoon, there was all this discussion during the two days, a lot of it was on efficacy. So efficacy is like having confidence in being able to do the science. And there was a lot of discussion about if you can just increase the efficacy of people like me, um, so that we believed and had confidence in our ability and our skill level, that we would continue on. And I was just, I just felt like I couldn't take it anymore. So I went outside of the room where everybody was in the auditorium and went and, and stood outside. And um, what was funny was that out there was, you know, seven or eight other people. Um, and we, it turned out that we were all from underrepresented groups um, and that we had all left tenure track or had, had not gone into tenure track positions. So we were the people that they were talking about in the room um, who had, who were leaving. And ironically, uh, we had left the room in which they were describing and talking about it because we couldn't take it anymore. And so we started to have a really, a real discussion about like, well, why did you leave? Or why didn't you go? Or, you know, what are you doing now? And one of the things that I really heard as we were talking was just how um, oppressive and how difficult the social environments were, that there was a sense of not fitting in and just it being tiring, trying to bridge the gap between our own cultures and the culture of, of our disciplines and that the value systems of the disciplines really were not um, our own values and wondering really if it was meaningful work to be doing. And here we are, we all had PhDs and were, um, you know, fairly successful. Uh, and yet we had choice. And if, if the work did not matter to us, why would we stay there? We could go someplace else that where we could do work that matters to us. And so, um, this kind of bridged between, for me, uh, work that I had done as a graduate student with Herb Kelman, which was on how people integrate into communities. And that's that has been the research that I then went back to um, a study that I was running and I added in the variable of values. Um, the science identity was already in there and efficacy was already in there and did 
collected data to show, which I eventually did in the 2011 publication, that the values and identity were actually much more strongly predicted persistence for underrepresented groups than, um, or historically underrepresented groups than, than uh, the efficacy. And, uh, and that kind of launched a whole bunch of research and kind of a new thinking about why people persist or don't persist, so. Wow, I, I can hear you tell that story over and over again. And I think I take something different away from it every time. It's really fascinating. Um, first of all, it clearly obviously demonstrates the value of, di of diversity and pro sol solving problems, right? But that notion of that cultural mismatch and how important it is to really be able to see that and be sure that we're designing environments that are culturally responsive so we don't exclude people. Yeah, and create those toxic environments. Yep, and I think, I mean, another thing that's really interesting about that story for me and thinking about it is that one of the things that sometimes happens when people are talking about underrepresentation of, of um, historically underrepresented groups is they talk about it as if we aren't in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that was exhausting about being there. It was, it was as if we were invisible, you know, they leave, but actually we are in the room right now. And, um, and that not, it makes, it reinforces the fact that, that we aren't them because they're talking about them <laughs> who are out there, right. Who aren't staying um, instead of we are here. Some of us feel more included than others. So let's talk about that. Mm. That's a, we, we, including everyone, um, as opposed to them being outside the room when we're actually sitting in the room. So that that's something to think about in classrooms too, is who's we, and is it including everybody who's in the room? Yeah. I'm reflecting on my own language. Mm -hmm. <sighs> it's a matter Powerful. of who's centered, right? So mm -hmm. if we're centering the white experience, then everybody else is other. But if we're centering all of our experiences collectively, then that's a different kind of centering of our, uh, in our language and in our way of approaching our teaching. Mm. So good. So good. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So next question. You also use this phrase, ambiguous culture. Oh yeah. Um, and that's another one that's really stuck with me. So I, I would like you to help unpack what ambiguous culture means and how kindness cues of social inclusion, which again is a concept from your work, really um, fits into that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we enter any space, um, even virtual spaces, mm -hmm. we scan faces and, and people to see who's like us and who's not, or who looks safe and who's not safe. And um, if we walk into an environment or we look at an environment and we feel like there's other people like us, there really is kind of a, a deep <laughs> ancient part of our brain that says it's safer if there's other people like us in the room. And so when we walk into an environment or we're in an environment where we're getting mixed cues, so some people look safe and some people don't, or some people speak and say things that feel safe and some people say and think and do things that don't feel safe, this leads to ambiguity. So we feel we're not sure. <laughs> We're not sure if it's a safe space or not. And by safe, I think in the social terms, I mean, we feel we can be our authentic self and be accepted for who that is. So there is a sense of physical safety, but there's also a social safety. Can I show up fully as who I am and not be persecuted in any way for that, be accepted? And so for people who don't come from the dominant white culture, the dominant culture, um, it could be, it doesn't have to be white, but in the United States, that tends to be it. There is a negotiation of, can I fit into this? Am I going to fit into this? And different things can cue different. So for instance, all four of my grandparents were born in Mexico. My brother has really dark skin. My dad has dark skin. My mom has light skin. I have light skin. So I walk into an environment, if somebody doesn't know my name, they may not know what ethnicity I am but I know, <laughs> and I go into an environment and I'm looking. So when there's ambiguity and I'm not sure if, if I fit in or not, if I belong or not, and the cues I'm getting, let's say there's people in the environment who are making derogatory comments about being immigrants, something like that. 
I might feel like, oh, that person's not so safe because they don't like people like me and they don't like people like me being in this environment. And that makes me start to scan and make sure, does, do I stay safe? Am I safe or not? And that takes up cognitive space in our brains, <laughs> in our brains. And that makes it less likely for me to be able to take in other information that might be the learning information. So ambiguity happens. I define it in the paper as situations in which you might have um, macro affirmations. So there's signs and images that diversity matters and we want everybody to be here. But the micro affirmations, the subtle ways in which people are communicating with me, they might be saying things or, or treating me differently. That gives low micro affirmation, which gives a mixed message. And then there might be um, very low macro aggression. So nobody's really saying things that are super prejudiced or holding anything against me, but there might be lots of microaggressions, subtle ways in which people are, are saying things and doing things that don't feel affirming. So it could be as, as a, a micro affirmation might be that everybody gets called on equally in the, in the class. Um, a microaggression might be that, that men or white men are called on more often than, than somebody who is, um, has darker skin and who is a woman. So that would be an example of kind of a micro subtle way. Um, and that the, and it's really those subtle micro ways are really complicated because if somebody calls it out, they might go, well, that, that had nothing to do with it. Right. They, they're able, people kind of, kind of, are, they're not clear. It's not 100% clear that that was an aggression or an affirmation of any sort. So, so that's, um, that's the, the, ambiguous situations. And we are not designed for ambiguity, as we know from doing COVID this last um, year. Lots and lots of ambiguity in our environment. We haven't known a lot and you can feel the stress. People should feel and know what that stress feels like to not be sure about so much stuff. It really is hard on our bodies. It's hard on our, on our minds. Um, I'm sure people who are out there experience times when it was hard to memorize things or to remember things or you know, that that's when things are ambiguous and we don't know what's going on, it does impact our cognitive functioning and our emotional um, well-being. So. Okay, so I have a follow-up question. You mentioned that um, that ambiguity exists in virtual places. Let's imagine being in an online class that's asynchronous, which primarily in higher education leans on the written word. So you don't have the, the, maybe the traditional safety cues that you're used to scanning for without even being real, without even recognizing that you're really scanning for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what effect does that have on a person? And do you agree that, you know, using brief video clips, friendly video clips to welcome students is a form of a micro affirmation that would be helpful to kind of alleviate that ambiguous. Ambiguity. Yeah, I think that that's really, um, yeah, it's really important. I think we get a lot more information from visual than we do from writing or from just a picture. Although pictures can send a lot of information, but but yeah, I think that video um, really matters. And I, you may be familiar with the research by uh, Dr. Nalini on body, which has to do with thin slices and how, uh, students that were, she, she had tapes of, of faculty giving kind of their intro um, to a course. And she looked to see how much time um, students had to see these videos in order to be able to predict the overall evaluation of the professor at the end of the semester. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I do. It was in um, Blink. He writes about it in Blink, but the research is by Nalini and Body. And and what she found was, I think it takes like 30 seconds of video clip, very thin slice for students to be able to predict how well that professor did in, in the course, you know, overall evaluation. Okay, so there's a couple of things that are really pertinent for us here. One is that they used video clips <laughs> to test that. that. The students that were in the classroom and the person who watched the video clips got very, gave very similar evaluations. So that intro video that you do, super important because it tells people a lot of information and it's impression formation. You're, you're creating that first impression that basically gives a framework in which other information will then be integrated into. 
So that first impression is super important. And another thing that's pretty interesting about that that first impression, and, and this goes back to whether you're centering or not centering the, the kind of mainstream white experience. So one thing that we know or that we've learned from a, there was an article that was recently published by um, Angela Byers Winston, and she talks about the cultural um, awareness of, of mentors, but it applies to this too, because one of the things that she talks about is how acknowledging that we all have different cultures is important. So that's that's decentering the white experience. So we're not assuming everybody has the same culture, <laughs> but but widening out that we all have culture, right? We all come with culture with things that we bring. And that's another thing that I think helps decenter kind of the dominant culture by in your introduction, acknowledging that we all come with different valuable cultural experiences that will help inform the work that we're doing going forward and the learning and all of that. So there's another place where I think, I think there's opportunity for setting an impression and, and really prioritizing. So one of the old ways of thinking was that education was about assimilating everybody into this one way of being. And if you don't want to assimilate, then you're not going to survive. That's, that's the old fashioned colonized way of thinking about things. And now we are moving past that. We're decolonizing our education system. And that means that we're no longer assimilating. We are affirming each other and who we are and taking the best of that and using that for our education and, and our thinking and our innovation and our creativity and all those wonderful things that are available to us now. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. I I have learned so much and I'm going to watch this video, I think a hundred more times because I know I'm going to keep learning. So um, I'm going to end there. Dr. Estrada, thank you so much for sharing your welcome. knowledge you and insights me. with us.